Okay, may, can, may we start now? Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome you to attend this forum hosted by China Administration of Cyberspace. Uh, I am uh, Zhou Hui from uh, China Cyber and Information uh, Law Society, and also from the Institute of Law, China Academy of Social Sciences. We all know that uh, in these days, uh, personal information protection is a very hot topic in the uh, digital economy era. Lots of governments have passed the laws and have carried out their enforcement in this area. Uh, and a lot of companies have do their compli compliance practices as well. Uh, I think this forum will provide a platform to exchange thoughts and ideas. Today we have four speakers, one from the civil society and three from the uh, private sector. Uh, there are three big platform companies. One is uh, Xinlang in China, uh, a social uh, a platform and uh, Meituan Dimxing, a uh, Chinese e-commerce platform for service, and also we well know a uh, company, Soft, Microsoft. So uh, I will ask the first uh, speaker, Professor Zhang Jiyu. He is from the uh, Future Rule of Law uh, Institute, China's Renmin University, and her topic is about the personal information protection from the perspective of the draft of the personality rights section of Chinese Civil Code. Okay, it's your turn. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Ji Zhang from Renmin University of China, and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to talk about the personal information protection from the perspective of the draft of the personality rights section of Chinese Civil Code. Yeah. Of course, first of all, there are already many laws regarding to the protection of the personal information in China, including the criminal law, cybersecurity law, and also the general rules of the civil law. And we also have national standards about the information technology, and personal information security specification. And the personal information protection law is in the legislative, legislation schedule too. But uh, the China's uh, personal rights section of the Chinese Civil Code, they have a very uh, significant chapter regarding to the right of privacy and the personal information protection. The draft was submitted to the National People's Congress Standing Committee for third reading in August this year, and it was released for public consultation in September this year. Uh, well, looking at the goal of the draft of the personality rights section, first of all, it wants to compel the personality, personality rights in accordance with the needs of the times. We see that in our time, we are facing the fast development of cyberspace. It's integrating internet, mobile networks, IoT, blockchains, cloud computing, uh, big data, AI, and other information technologies. And our social behaviors, which social economy and people's behaviors, and almost everything are more and more going to the cyberspace with the increasingly vast application of algorithms and and also the integration of cyberspace and the real space, we can see that IT uh, te uh, information technologies are have playing a more and more important role in our lives and may have more and more impact on the uh, people's rights. So we see that in the draft of the personality rights section, they're looking carefully to the personality rights in the digital uh, age. For example, we see that with the development of AI, there are various use of personal voices, and so this brings to the need to protect personal voice. So there is an article uh, stipulating that we should protect personal voice just as a personal portrait. And the other part is 
this draft want to provide an important measure to comprehensively guarantee the dignity of the individual personality and the decent life of people in the new era. And among all the highlights of this draft, there are two aspects I want to emphasize today here. One is that this draft distinguishes between privacy and personal information. And the other is that this draft maintains the openness of personality right system, including the openness of privacy and personal information. So why? Why to distinguish the two and why to maintain the openness? Uh, first of all, we see that this uh, draft uh, really distinguishes the privacy and the personal information. The privacy in this law refers to the private space, private activities, private information, and so on, which natural persons would not want the others to know. But personal information refers to various informations that can identify a specific natural person. Uh, it includes a lot of kind of uh, information, of course. Uh, but we see that uh, the personal information in this draft is not yet described as a right yet. And also, the using of the personal information does not necessarily violate privacy. But on the other hand, the, the protection of personal information may help to prevent and control the risks of violating the personal privacy and may keep better balance of the potential algorithmic power and public power and personal rights. And we, uh, we can see there are a lot of debates in China and the vice president of my university, which is also a, a very important contributor to the draft, he is suggesting that we should describe the personal information as a right rather than not uh, specifically indicating it's a right. But there are many uh, different opinions too. So, I, in my opinion, one of the key questions here is that uh, is the personal information protection a means to an end, or is it an end in itself? Because we see it's different than privacy, we can see many kind of uses of the personal information in the non-digital era. But in the digital era, the use of personal information may uh, cause many risks. So maybe we should ask the questions that what are the goals to protect personal information? And if the goal is not only to protect the personal information, and we think uh, many people will agree it is to better prevent the violations of personal privacy and other human rights in this digital era, and also to enhance the trust of the public in this new digital era and to enhance the security of the public. So we should ask, is it efficient enough or effective enough? And uh, if not, what are the other possible measures that we can work together and to help to achieve our goal? to better protect the personal privacy and other uh, human rights in the digital era. And of course, how to balance with other values and goals. So we think that since the theories and these questions are not fully answered, there are still a lot of to studies to do in this year in this aspect. So that is the reason, one of the reasons that in this draft it is not described as personal information right, but rather the protection of personal information. And the other, the second uh, issue I want to address is that the openness of the personality rights system in the draft. The article 774 of this draft stipulates that the personal, uh, personality rights include the right of life, body, health, name, identity, portrait, reputation, honor, privacy, and so on. And in the paragraph two of this article, it stipulates that in addition to the personality rights specified in the preceding paragraph, a natural person enjoys other personality interests based on personal freedom and personal dignity. So we can see this is an open uh, definition. 
And also, there are often, uh, are also, uh, etc. In the articles about the privacy and personal information, so we can see this also the openness of the definition of the uh, privacy and also the personal information. It maintains the openness of the personality rights system. So you can see uh, why. So why to maintain the openness? I think there are several reasons. Uh, first of all, we want to allow for a degree of flexibility of the concept of personality rights is that from the perspective of historical development, the type and the specific content of personality rights have gradually enriched with the development of social economy and also the technologies and have been gradually confirmed by law. So we are facing a world with the vast, uh, the vast development of technologies and the applications. So we can see that in order to reduce the need for new legislations every time the technologies and applications change or evolve, we should add some flexibility about the concept of personality rights and also the protection of personal information. And I think, in my opinion, there is a uh, other goal, that is to set up a goal and to ask the society to actively protect personal, personality right in the digital age. That is to see that that is to send out a signal that the law, the legislators, need the active cooperation with the society, with the industries, with the scientists in this fast developing digital age to figure out how we can better provide people's uh, privacy and provide people's personal information. Uh, that reminds me of a, a very typical, very classic paper. Uh, it was written 20 years ago by the Professor Lawrence Lessig. In his famous uh, paper, he writes that uh, there are at least four modalities of the regulation in real space and in cyberspace. Um, the law, uh, social norms, marketing, and architecture. And for the architecture in the cyberspace, it mainly refers to the code running on the computers and other information processing uh, devices. And so, uh, in, uh, although I think maybe the most uh, famous sentence in his work is that code is law, but I think it's more important that he set up a framework that to say that uh, we should firstly ask what value we are pursuing in the uh, regulations, and also uh, if we figure out the value, and then we should ask how the uh, different modalities of regulation uh, work and how they impact each other, and what might be the optimal, uh, the ideal side of uh, the mix of regulations. So there are some examples of the law and market and also the social uh, norm, they have impact on code. For example, in the recent, I think, uh, two or three years, uh, a concept of federated learning is uh, getting very popular in China, I think uh, also in many other countries too. This uh, federated learning is about a kind of machine learning techniques that trains an algorithm across multiple decentralized edge devices or servers holding local data samples without exchanging their data samples. That is to say the, uh, this kind of learning will not need to gather all the data together, but they can uh, still train a fine algorithm. And this uh, this uh, is very, uh, I, I don't think it can solve uh, all the problems that we have facing the in personal information protection, but it certainly shows that the law and market can have some impact on the code. Uh, that is to say, uh, first of all, we should look at the motivating uh, forces about this technology. First of all, we see that uh, the market has some pressure on the algorithm because, uh, for example, some banks will not 
are willing to share their data with other banks, but they still have the need to train the algorithm to better to control the risks from all the data with each other. So uh, this is the pressure of the market. And also there are uh, definitely pressure from the law because of for example, GDPR and other personal information protection laws all over the world. They are asking the uh, industry and the technologists to think about how to better achieve their goal without uh, violating people's uh, privacy and personal information. So we can also see this. This has uh, many, uh, some, several patent applications in China too, which shows that industry is really paying attention to this kind of uh, uh, this kind of algorithm to build, to try to build better product with on device data and uh, privacy by default, privacy by design. So we see that there can be a, a very important cooperation from the legislators, the society, and all the uh, industry and uh, uh, scientists. We think that in order to promote personal information protection better, we really need to think about how to promote it through the mix of multiple regulatory modalities and also through the cooperation. This is, I believe, a very important aspect of the social governance model based on collaboration, participation, and common interest which China is developing these years. And I am also really interested and really excited to the following speaker's speech because they all come from the industry and we can see how they have the perspective of how to better promote personal information protection. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Zhang. I think uh, I totally agree with you that the openness of the uh, social uh, uh, the the personality interest uh, system in China is also very uh, good for uh, other countries to have to, uh, to 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 this topic. And uh, only the multiple measures of the different subjects and the different measures can do the best to the governance on this topic. Uh, I think also it is a. Uh, theme and also the principles for the IGF. So, okay, let's uh, go to the second speaker, uh, Mrs. Gu Haiyan. Uh, she is the general counsel of the general legal, legal counsel of Xinlang company. Uh, her topic is about the elements and the principles of commercial use of personal data. Okay, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Helen from Sina Corporation, and we have two NASDAQ listed company. One is Sina.com, it's a portal website. The other one is Weibo.com, it's a social media platform. And uh, Weibo.com, uh, let me introduce it simply. It is a product uh, similar as with the uh, Twitter plus Facebook, and we have more than 600 million active users. So we are the biggest Chinese social media platform. And it's great honor for me to be invited here to share with our, with you, our understanding and the knowledge in this topic. Um, my topic is responses and practice of data commercialized in enterprises. Okay. The first part, let me move on the consent. Personal data is becoming not only an important part of the enterprise access, but also an important strategic resources of the countries. Let's move on to the definition of the ISO and IEC. Data is a procession of information in formalized manner suitable for communication, interpretation, and processing. When we see in the definition of the data in comparative law, we will see in India and Brazil, also in the 2018, their personal data protection bill is processing. And in GDPR, there are two kinds of the personal data. One is the information relation to the identifier or identified person 
directly or indirectly, such as the name, ID card, local data, another kind of the personal data, it is uh, relevantly um, because they are subject to a higher level protection, such as the genetic, biometric, health data. We, we can see the focus on the compliance of the GDPR, the obligation of the enterprise to inform. The data manager should have the obligation to inform the person before collecting, using, processing personal information. And op corporate has the obligation to remove. It's based on the right of the deletion and the forgotten. The data manager should delay the personal information according to the requirements of the data subject under such certain circumstance. And the notification obligation in the case of leakage, damage, or loss of the personal information, the data managers should properly report relevant incidents to the competent authority and notify the data subject. The second part is legislative framework and the general principles. Some people compare the personal data to the footprints of individuals, and the tasks of the data develops is to build roads according to those footprints. For the road, we can adhere to the attitude of prudence and our tolerance, and the user, they can choose to leave or not to leave the footprints. So at the same time, the road cannot be built without data developers. So we need to protect the business interests of the data developers as the builders. Okay, legislative framework. There are four levels of legislative framework in China. The first one is laws. The second one is department rules. The third one is judicial interpretation. The fourth one is the national standard. Okay, we will see. The personal information protection law has been listed in the legislative pre program. And the data security management measures also draft from comment. And the provisions on the cyber protection of children's personal information, and also some other app uh, law violation methods for collecting and using drafting. Let's move on. Processes and the principles. We can see there are three principles of the premises. The first one also is the most important of the one is safeguard the national security and the national sovereignty. The, third, the second one is the full respect for the privacy of the data subjects. And the third one we will try to use on the basis of, of the existing legal protection framework. Basic principle of commercial use of data, we will talk about uh, three principles. The first one is the user consent and the transparency. Here, an open and transparent disclosure is maintained for the data subject. Data security principle includes two principles. One is quality principle, the other one is security principle. When there is a mistake in the data, it should be correct as soon as possible, and you should take necessary measures when integrity is being destroyed. Basic principle of commercial use data also com um, includes respect the principle of creating commercial interests and values. The role of data, especially the personal data, and the role of the parties in the data industry chain in personal data, they should be fully respected. Okay, the third part of my speech is corporate practice. Data have four stage of, of influence. That means uh, data collection, data processing and utilization, data transmission, data storage and deletion. In data collection phase, when collecting sensitive personal information, the consent of the subject of the personal information is required. 
and the corporate data compliance experience in data collection phase. You should inform your users whether to fully explain the collection method and purpose. Clearly listed the correspondence between each functional module and the collected information. Also inform your users the cookie and other similar technology how to collect. In data processing utilization stage, you should build uh, level protection, technical measures, and uh, anonymization. After the user logs out to the account, the personal information should be deleted in time, and the user cannot be so associated with a specific individual and cannot be restormed. That's called anonymization. In data processing, Utilization stage, you should clear rules of use and build up the correspondence with the scenes and the purpose of the user portrait. In data flow phase, you should build the security assessment. That means if the child's personal information is transferred to a third party, it should conduct a security assessment by the self or by a third party or agency. And in data storage and deletion phase, you can see domestic storage and the encryption and the delete in time. Encryption means network operators should take measures such as encryption to store children's personal information to ensure their information security. And in data storage phase, storage clear methods, storage deadlines, and storage standards. It should be the shortest time to achieve the purpose and express the time limit. And the retention period required by laws and regulations should be met. Okay, let's make the conclusion. We believe we should grasp the common sense, explore the business logic of data utilization, and consider the legitimate interests of data developers while protecting the rights of data subjects. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gu. She has uh, given us a very info, useful introduction of different rules and also the practices of their uh, compliance of data protection. Okay, next we go to the third speaker. Uh, she is uh, Tanya Byrne. She is the head of Berlin, uh, uh, head of uh, Microsoft Berlin uh, for corporate external and legal affairs. Her speech will be the uh, global privacy protection in an evolving world and industry approach. Please. Okay. Th thank you very much. Um, so good morning and thanks for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a great pleasure and uh, please allow me as well to warmly welcome you in Germany, to warmly welcome you in my hometown in Berlin. It's, um, it's great to see so many international um, people here in my hometown. So, and again, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's my first panel where I actually have my name written in Chinese. So um, thank you for doing this. I'll keep this if I may. <laughs> So my, my speech will be around privacy protection in an evolving world. Being European, I would like to first share a little bit of the history of data protection um, in Europe and in Germany in particular. And then I will briefly touch on the GDPR. You also alluded to it already. And finally, I would like to share um, the approach Microsoft takes towards privacy and data protection. So. Um, let me start by sharing some thoughts about privacy in Germany or privacy in Europe. I would say based on our historical experience, especially in Germany, um, the European continent attached a great value to the protection of personal information. And again, this is true for Germany in particular. The first world's data protection law came actually out of Germany, out of the state of Hesse, which is one of the 16 federal states or lender, we say in Germany. 
um, in the middle of Germany. And that was back in 97. Yeah? And the federal, so the Data Protection Act for all of Germany, not only for the state of Hesse, um, followed seven years later. And this shows that already at the end of the 1970s, yeah, data protection played an important role in the minds and in the minds of the civilization and as well of the regulators. And until the beginning of the early 1990s, um, data protection laws followed in each 16 lender in Germany. So we have 17 data protection regulations in Germany at that time. And however, the, the, the biggest foundation for data protection in Germany was laid in 1983 by the German Federal Constitutional Court, who ruled um, that there is a right for informational self-determination. And this was the foundation for having data protection as a fundamental right in the German constitution. A couple of years later, in the, in the 90s, in 1995, the European Directive um, with regards to processing personal data came into force. And we all know that the GDPR was been intensively discussed, not only in Europe, but also in other states, um, came into force in 2016. And it directly applies in all 28 member states in, German, in, in Europe, not only in Germany. So. so the GDPR is designed to give individuals more control over their data um, over the fact how the data is collected, used, and protected online. The GDPR applies broadly to all organizations of all sizes and types, including large businesses and small businesses, and also public authorities. The point of the GDPR is to protect the data belonging to EU citizens and residents but therefore it also applies to all organizations that handle such data, whether they are based in the EU or elsewhere on the world, because it's about data belonging to EU citizens and their residents. The GDPR also introduces penalties, which was the first, yeah, first time, for non-compliance with up to 20 million euro penalties or 4% of the worldwide annual turnover, which might be even greater than these 20 million euros. So what are the key changes to address the GDPR? The GDPR contains many requirements about how organizations collect, store, and use personal data. This means not only how they identify and secure the personal data in their systems, but also how they handle new transparency requirements and how they detect and report personal data breaches and how they train privacy personnel and their other employees. So this slide shows an overview of the most important requirements coming out of the GDPR. For the interest of time, I will not go through all of them, but I do believe that this slide provides a good overview and a good understanding of the complexity requirements that we as a company and others need to meet. So what does that mean for Microsoft? Let me share some thoughts about Microsoft's broader mission and the importance of privacy protection resulting from that. At Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. As you can see here, it's Satya Nadella's signature. He introduced it when he came into the role of the Microsoft CEO. In all our activities, we aim to maintain the timeless value of privacy and preserve our customers' ability to control their own data. We have developed six Microsoft privacy principles. From that foundation of the approach I just described, and 
these foundations, these principles um, apply in the way we shape every product and service. So it's control, transparency, security, strong legal protection, and also important non-content based targeting. And our aim is that this all benefits to you as in to, to the customer that we address. So what we want to is when we do collect data, we will use it to the benefit of our customers and to make their experience even better. So at Microsoft, we believe that the GDPR is an important step forward for privacy rights in Europe and around the world. In fact, we have always been enthusiastic supporters of the GDPR since it was first pr proposed back in 2014. And this is why Microsoft were the first company worldwide to extend the rights that are at the heart of the GDPR to all our customers, consumer customers worldwide. And these so-called data subject rights include the right to know what, the, what data we collect. It also includes the right to correct the data for the customer, to delete it, or to even take it somewhere else. We, we have or, 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 no, operationalized, thank you <laughs> for your patience, this through our so-called privacy dashboard, which, which gives our users the tools they need to take to have control over their own data. So only one year after the GDPR went into effect, more than 18 million people from all around the world have used our tool to manage their personal information. Well, in fact, the highest level of engagement still comes from the United States, but also, again, from other countries around the world. And for us, this has been a clear, a very clear sign that people all over the world want to be empowered to control their data and to know what happens to their data. The truth is, we ourselves, as Microsoft, have, have come a long GDPR journey that include valuable learnings we had ourselves. Since its early beginnings, we have been committed to making sure that our products and services comply with the GDPR. And this is also why, still today, yeah, we have more than 1,600 engineers across the company working on GDPR projects. And since its enactment in 2016, we have made significant investments to redesign our tools, system, processes, and to help our customers to meet the requirements of the GDPR. So one can say, today, GDPR compliance is deeply embedded in Microsoft's technology and culture as well. Let me close by saying that from all of this, what I just shared, the history in Europe, the learnings that Microsoft took and how we implement actually GDPR requirements and data protection approach in our products, we at Microsoft believe that privacy is a fundamental human right, as it was stated in the German constitution a long, a long while ago. So privacy is also the foundation of trust. We know that people will only use technology when they have trust in technology. This means companies like ours have the responsibility, this is how we see it, to protect the privacy of the personal data we collect and the data we manage. So thank you very much for your attention and for letting me share Microsoft's perspective here today. I highly appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tanya. Uh, I think you have given us a very useful introduction of the privacy protection in EU and Germany, and also Microsoft's uh, journey and learning in this field. Uh, I agree with you that in the digital era, no privacy, no trust, and no trust, no development. But also, I think you raised a very interesting topic. Maybe we, we can discuss later, just whether should the 
rights listed in GDPR to be, should be extended to other countries, or you mentioned worldwide. I think we can discuss it later. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And uh, then we come to the last speaker, last but not the least important, uh, uh, Mr. Liu Jian. He is the senior legal director of Meituan Dianping. Uh, his topic is about personal data protection in e-commerce platform for services. Okay, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jian Liu, and I'm from the Meituan Dianping. Uh, it will be a great honor to be the guest speaker of this uh, conference. Uh, let's first uh, give a short introduction of our company, Meituan Dianping, uh, to those who are maybe not that familiar with us. Uh, Meituan Dianping uh, is a leading e-commerce platform uh, for the services in China. Actually now, uh, we are the third uh, largest TMT companies uh, publicly listed uh, in China, and we have uh, maybe the capital um, cap of over uh, 60 billion US dollars. Uh, and also you can see that uh, we have maybe 440 million a total number of annual transaction users, and we have operated in more than uh, 2,800 cities. And also we have, you know, in the last 12 months, uh, as of the June, we have, you know, 3.70 million riders. So uh, actually you can see we are, you know, a large company. And if I can give you a short, you know, just an introduction, we are the Chinese version of Deliveroo plus, uh, plus Yelp, plus Booking, plus Uber, uh, and uh, many things covering the daily life of the people. Uh, uh, this is, you know, this is a short, you can see that some uh, business model of us. For example, uh, we operate lots of well-known APPs in China. We have, you know, we have Meituan, we have Dajong Dianping, uh, we have Waimaya, the food delivery, and also I think we have the Mobag. Yes, Mobag is one uh, brand, and maybe you can have that bike sharing also in Berlin. Uh, <laughs> And also, you can see that we are the you know, platform uh, to connect both the customers and uh, the merchants, mostly of the restaurants and for other merchants as well. And I think that for this maybe graph, we should add one more side on that. Also, we have 3.7 million riders. It's you know, deliver the food daily you know, to every person in China. And we have lots of lots of businesses. As you can see that, for example, uh, one major business of us is food delivery. Also, the other one is book, uh, hotel booking. And also, you know, we have also have, you know, some to be businesses, uh, business to business. We have delivered, you know, materials, raw materials to the small restaurants. We also, you know, for the customers, you can, you know, order the food or other things online. And our writers will, you know, deliver the food or other stuff to your home. Uh, this is, you know, we have a people, maybe Chinese people, or other people called Emmy. So this, this is the Emmy stay with uh, Meituan Dianping. Maybe in the morning when you wake up, if you want to have a dinner, you can just, you know, uh, you know, search for the restaurants, that, you know, just like Yelp. You can search the best restaurants in town. And also then you can just make a reservation. And maybe at 12 p.m., you know, you are at work. You don't have time to go out. So it's simple. You can just order the food delivery. Our writers will send food to to office or other places. At 2 p.m., you, go, you can make hotel reservations if you want to go on vacation. And at 5 p.m., yeah, you can ride a Mobac to the, to the restaurant that you, at your choice. And also maybe 7 p.m., you just enjoy, enjoy the dinner time. You don't need to wait there online. You can just to, to give a reservation online before or in advance. And also, you can become, if you want to watch a movie, you can also you know, use our APP Moyen. You can just reserve you know, the uh, movie tickets. And, you know, also in, at the end of the day, if you're still hungry, you can order, you know, also the, the some time, uh, some food uh, from our platform. So this is a, this is a lot of the things that we can cover. Uh, to add one more, our mission is we help people live better, eat better. So uh, this is a short general introduction, and next time we'll talk something, uh, share our perspective of the data protection. Uh, in general, we always you know, put our uh, customers in priority. We believe that the 
data protection and their privacy are really important to us. So we will definitely follow this lots of lots of principles of the data protection. For example, there's control by users, transparency, necessity, and technical support. Uh, we can, you know, give you guys more examples. This is a life circle of the data security management system. This is our, you know, something that we want to protect uh, our customers' uh, data privacy. For example, you know, the data collection, uh, of course, as a, you know, very, you know, huge platform. In, in some necessary situations, we need to collect, uh, you know, customers' data. For example, if we, we want to deliver food to their home, we need to use their location. We need to maybe their uh, mobile phone number. So uh, this is data collection only necessary. Uh, second one is data access system. Of course, you know, in our company, only the people have the authorization, right authorization, who can have the access to the personal data. It's uh, very strict rules. Uh, and for this data processing, you know, after we get into the, you know, this data, we need to get some processing work. Uh, in this, you know, we, we will also you know, put the principles here. So for example, we will have this pseudonymization, uh, hopefully my pronunciation is right. You know, we just remove the, you know, their sensitivity uh, identifiers when it's not necessary. Uh, so our customers, you know, data privacy will not be compromised. And also, you know, next one, your know, data sharing, because, you know, we are, as you can see, there are a lot of parties in our ecosystem. So uh, sometimes we have to share because, you know, for example, we have to share the customer's data with the restaurant so they can make, prepare the food. We need, sometimes we need to you know, share the data with the writers so they can, they can you know, send the food to their home. So, but when, they do the, uh, when we do that, we will do the you know, data encryption uh, to protect you know, privacy. Uh, and also, you know, for some you know, third-party suppliers or some third-party corporators, we will have the confidentiality agreement with them further protect the confidentiality. Uh, Fifthly, the data audit, you know, this just data audit with, with some, you know, suppliers or you know, third parties. And the data deletion, we will ensure that, you know, when our customers is no longer want with us, they can have the right to delete their account in our APPs and, you know, their information will be dealt with in accordance with, uh, you know, all the applicable, uh, applicable rules. Next one, yeah, I think we, we'll give you more examples, hopefully my Speech will not be that boring. Sorry, it's, in, uh, it's food delivery. Sorry, it's in Chinese, so I will translate for you. Uh, first to that, you know, uh, our platform will use, uh, you know, put a lot of money every year to, you know, just to provide this kind of uh, privacy numbers. Uh, you know, for example, you know, when this, in the food delivery business, you know, uh, when the you know riders just send the you know when the riders send the food to the to the customers you know they, they need to call they need to call the customers. We will use this you know will not you know in the mobile phone it will not be shown as the real telephone number of the customers. It will be shown as this artificially randomly created privacy number so that they will not be seen you know. And also sometimes we will put some you know. Some hide address, hide of address matters to further protect, you know, this uh, customer's privacy. And this car healing, yes, we do have some car healing just like Uber businesses in China. So uh, if you call, uh, you know, call our car uh, and our APPs, you know, for the drivers and the customers, they need to call each other. We also provide this kind of uh, artificial privacy numbers. This hotel booking. Uh, under this scenario, before the hotel accepts the customer's uh, order, the hotel manager, they cannot see the uh, you know, people, the customers, the name and the real telephone number. Only after the order is accepted, you know, this hotel can also see that privacy number. And after the end of the order, that the, the, the hotel manager will have no access to that number any, any longer. And, uh, and for this trend and effort, we believe that uh, the people's privacy and you know, data will become more and more important. So uh, we, as, you know, as one of the big you know, ecosystems and one of the big platforms in China, we really treasure this and we will always respect the customer's uh, privacy and data protection. 
And from our end, we will always you know, do some policy research, but while we follow the you know, uh, best uh, practices of the world and also this development of the policy. And we, as you know, technology TMT company, we think that technology is also important. So we will try our best to you know, make the innovations in this field and try to find other ways in technical you know, method to protect, further protect the customer's privacies. And at the last but not the least, you know, uh, we have an ecosystem. Lots of parties are, are involved. For example, the customers, merchants, writers, and so on. So we are hoping that all these parties in our ecosystem can help us and give us guidance and supervision. So together with all our parties, we, we believe that we can build you know, a better society, a better world without com compromising their data privacy. We can accomplish our mission to help people eat better, live better. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, now we have about uh, eight minutes for comments and discussion. Uh, any participants, if you have any comments and questions, please hands up and tell me. Yes, you can give a brief introduction of yourself, and also a very short question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vicky, and I'm a year 10 student from Hong Kong. Nowadays, we would always have to fill our personal data online. Also, when our personal data would be used to gain access, we don't notice that. We just press the button to give access and continue to do what we want. As we want to do our things promptly, we may neglect the risk of leaking our data. And, the, and how can we promote public awareness to prevent more people leaking their personal data? Thank you. So, who are you going to ask? Uh, anyone. Anyone? <laughs> so, any speakers want to reply to this question? Mr. Liu? Uh, it's a very good question. I think that uh, in Chinese, that traditionally the personal information is not that uh, important. But nowadays, I know that with the uh, you know, development of our society, we know that it's becoming more and more important. So uh, in how to improve the public awareness? I think first, you know, uh, we, we have a lot of parties. First, you know, to, from the regulator side, they can, you know, you know, take more approach, they can educate people, uh, they can, you know, do some, you know, public campaigns to, to, to let them know this. From the private, from, from the private sector, of course, you know, I think that most, uh, I think the most large, at least the most large uh, platforms and TMD company in China, we have noticed the importance of this one. So we have actually uh, try our, take any measures to educate our employees to take any measures to protect the personal information of our customers. And, you know, from our side, we will also do some, you know, good stuff to, to improve this aspect. I think this is from the private sector and public sector. So for other things, maybe other, I think, guest speaker can, can contribute more. Thank you. OK. So maybe we can go to the next question. OK. Please. Thank you, Dr. Zhou. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, also from the China, and I just want to ask some questions about the, the GDPR. I, may I ask the, the Tanjia? Uh, I just want to know that the GDPR and uh, is also uh, about the data legislation in China is recently very concerned. And can you give me some advice about uh, GDPR in in Chinese internet companies and uh, uh, give me some suggestion about how to your best practice. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a great question, though. <laughs> Um, I, I think you truly understand that I can speak for Microsoft, that's for sure. And as I stated before, um, we, we apply the GDPR to uh, commercial customers worldwide. Yeah. Um, and I, I can't speak for, for any other companies here. Um, 
would do business in, in China, I would say. But uh, I would probably also build on the question before. I think um, it all starts with the education of the users to enable the user to, to, to know what happens to the data, to know what happens if you click a button, you know? And um, so I think no matter whether it's in China or Europe, yeah, it's key to create transparency by the companies that, process, that are processing data, yeah, but probably also from the regulator. This is what happened in, in, in Europe with the GDPR. Yeah? The, the European regulator did not want to rely on companies, basically not, you know, US American companies who, who are um, doing, doing IT business in Europe. So um, again, I think it's, it's the enablement of the users the transparency that has to be cr created by the business yeah? Yeah, yeah, and the right regulatory framework. If the GDPR is the right framework for China, I'm not the one to Okay, to Th yeah. thanks, thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah I, I totally agree with you. Okay, maybe we come to that question I have just mentioned after uh, Mrs. Tanya had made his speech that whether we should extend the rights listed in GDPR to other countries, uh, maybe it is a very, very uh, uh, question in other countries' legislation. So, uh, what's your opinion, Professor Zhang, in, in China's legislation on this in this field? Uh, thank you. And I think if we are talking about the principles, uh, broad uh, 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 concept of the regulation, I think yes, GDPR has show has certainly merit and show uh, to the world that we should pay attention to the people's privacy and to people's right in this digitalized world. But I think, uh, as I just mentioned, that there are many questions and many uh, many things that are still under the researchers. Now, that means we are still studying that what is the best way to protect people's privacy and to protect people's uh, basic rights in this digitalized world. Of course, I think GDPR has a very, uh, has shown a very great model, but uh, is it the best mechanism is still not quite sure. And I think that, of course, uh, maybe uh, even if GDPR is best for Europe, and it might not necessarily be the best kind of regulation in other countries, because the law should be considered in the whole legal system and also in consideration of the enforcement environment. So I think maybe there need a lot of study, but I certainly agree that the general principles of the to enhance the transparency, to empower user are very good and important principles that all the all governments, regulators and the companies should pay attention to. But we should still cooperate uh, with each other inside the, uh, each culture, inside each country to figure out what is the best uh, legal regulation in that country. Uh, that's my personal opinion. Thank you. So do we have any I, I comments? I totally agree. I mean, there's not one size fits all, yeah? And I mean, GDPR is a regulation, and regulations always have a lot to do with the history of the country or the region that regulates and the culture, yeah? And um, so, so I wouldn't say that necessarily, um, again, there's one size fits all. Of course, as I also stated before, data protection is the key issue of our, our, our days, yeah? handling data. So, um, but if the GDPR should be, you know, transmitted or transformed into various other countries, I, I'm not the one to tell. I would say it's, it, it depends on the region, I would say, yeah. Okay, so as we know now, the GDPR has also under evaluation by EU and also maybe evaluation by other countries' legislators. So I think maybe 
uh, we have to come to an end to our discussion and our forum. And thank you very much for, for your attending. Thank you.